Lackey is now running something of a dog walking empire in Virginia. And last year she had 2.3 million in annual revenue. When I wanted to start a business, the best advice I got was to go back to what you loved as a child. And so I thought, okay, animals are my first love, and what can I do to get a business that involves animals? Can I go for a walk? Mainly we do dogs and cats, um, but we've done iguanas, a hedgehog, ferrets, birds, Hamsters and guinea pigs, fish. We've had a koi pond. Come on, Casey. My father was a doctor, but loved farming more than anything. So we moved to the farm in Altoona, Pennsylvania when I was five. We had all the animals there from horses and cows, ducks, chickens, pigs. We always had at least three or four dogs running around. Even during pregnancy, I knew that the hours at the doctor's office were just too long to really be the kind of parent that I wanted to be, so I started researching what kind of business I would like to go into. It's a beautiful day to be a dog walker and a beautiful girl. Every book that I read said you need a business plan. Before I ever walked the first dog, I started my business plan. An idea is great, but you need more than just an idea. You need to know how you're going to make that idea come to life. When I started the business, uh, my son was about seven months old. I would put him in the backpack, and we would go to the plant's home, pick up the dog. He and I would go walk the dog, and then um, I would put him back in the car. We would go to the next house. It was a lot of fun. How are you doing with the heat out here with the dogs? Pretty good. It's been a little hectic. I did run myself ragged a lot in the beginning. About six months in the business, I was doing 16 visits a day, plus trying to handle the financial side and the client care side and, and the marketing and the growth. And I knew at that point I was ready to hire. I, it came much faster than I expected it to. By the end of that year, we were up at about 10 dog walkers. And we've just steadily grown ever since. I'm giving them a little bit shorter walks in the heat. Yeah. If they're big like Casey and they can't handle it. I'm not a pet care provider anymore. I am now an administrator. And so stepping out of what you love and into the running of the business is a big challenge. I don't do the work of the business anymore. Now I work on the business. I'm currently investigating um, opening a self-serve doggy wash. It'll be a way to support my clients and grow the business multidimensionally. You're really a natural businesswoman, aren't you? I guess so. Uh, business seems to come fairly easily to me. I think I'm more of an idea person. I can make the plans, I can put them on paper, but the implementation I need, I need help with a lot of times. And how's your schedule? Are you having too many dogs? Not enough dogs? And having Becky's pet care has allowed me to spend a lot more time with my children, although there were times when the business encompassed all of me um, more than any job I ever would have. I've also always had the flexibility to stay home with them when they're sick, go on a field trip. How big do you want to get? The sky's the limit. I mean, I just want to be a part of all the pets in Northern Virginia. Now, a takeaway I learned from talking to Becky is a fairly simple one, and that is that hard work is the secret to entrepreneurial success. Uh, everyone always wants to know what the secret is. Well, that, that's, that's the secret. Um, we, we ran this video in the Times uh, right before Christmas this past year, and I wrote uh, an article that went along with it, so I needed to call Becky up, and I thought I would ask her about 
the first few months when she was starting her business 15 years ago, because I knew she had started actually around the holiday times. And so I asked her what her Christmas was like that very first year as a startup solo entrepreneur. And not surprisingly, she told me that she worked the entire day. She told me, I was so excited to have a lot of business and to be earning money and to see that my business was credible. It was a great day. So uh, the lesson from this, uh, in my estimation, is that success does not come by accident. It comes, it comes through consistent hard work. It comes from that passion that drives you day and night as you pursue your dream. And you know, sometimes we see other people succeeding and we think, well, they probably had extra help or it's easier for them or you know, they just got lucky. The likelihood is that they just worked extra hard. Um, you know, look at Becky. She, she didn't have anyone helping her. She didn't have a rich husband. She didn't even have a business background. But what she did have was she had a plan and she had a laser-like focus on a goal, and she had a drive to achieve it. She took risks, she handled setbacks, she surrounded herself with good people and smart employees. So, so keep that all in mind. There's, there's no such thing as overnight success. It takes persistence and perseverance. Go the extra mile, work the extra hours, make the sacrifice. There are no shortcuts to get to the place you wanna be. So the last entrepreneur I'll mention, and this one will be brief, literally, is Sarah, <laughs> is Sarah Blakely of Spanx, who I interviewed a few years back uh, in her hometown of Atlanta. And I bring her up because I think she's such a great uh, example of there are no dumb ideas in business. Um, sometimes your idea, whether it's an idea for a business or a new product or a new direction for your company. You know, sometimes that idea you have, it doesn't have to be cutting edge brilliant. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we think it has to be, but you don't have to invent, you know, the Hadron Collider. You don't need to start the next Apple or IBM or even Facebook. Uh, some years ago, Sarah was inspired to create her company because, and this is a direct quote from her, she said, I did not like the way my butt looked in white pants. <laughs> so she cut the feet off a pair of pantyhose and she just wore the body slimming top part and she named it Spanx and then she went out and found a manufacturer because of course, you know, the world really needed this product. So this is the part of the story where I should say that Sarah Blakely is now a billionaire. She, uh, Spanx are now sold in 50 countries around the world, and she is actually the youngest self-made woman to make Forbes billionaire list. So I cite her as an example just to remind you all to uh, cut yourselves a little slack. Um, sometimes, especially when you're at an event like this, um, you know, it's easy to maybe compare yourself to others and to think your idea, your plan, or your business isn't as great as somebody else's. Uh, you know, the truth is you never know what's going to work. Nobody does. And an idea that you think might be laughable or stupid or not as good as anyone else's might be the next big thing. So all ideas have merit. Sometimes they just need to be tweaked or morphed or just modified into absolute brilliance. So stop being critical of your inner genius. Uh, let the ideas flow. Talk to the people you trust about how to make them work. Get feedback. And, but most importantly, if you believe in your idea, no matter what it is, don't be afraid to go for it. So that's a few lessons we can learn from some of the super successful ladies out there. Uh, before I leave the stage, I was asked to share a few practical tips with you all, just so that you have a few, you know, this was, I guess, from the super successful ladies, that's more of the motivational sort of stuff you can take with you, but I wanted to give you a few practical tips that you might be able to employ, maybe even today, uh, since, we're, since we're essentially at a networking event, I thought I'd share three tips with you about how to network. 
and uh, which is a topic I've written about. For some reason, and I'm not sure why, people tend to even hate the word networking, uh, maybe because it sounds like a lot of work. And if you're uh, a bit introverted, the, the thought of walking into a room like this full of strangers and you know, having to talk about yourself or your business can, can be a bit terrifying. So, but it's important to network because as we all know, networking really goes hand in hand with having a successful business. So here are my three practical tips for networking. So my first tip, and we're it's a little late right now for this, but my first tip is when you go to a networking event, always get there on the early side. Uh, and, and it's almost counterintuitive, because we all think, oh, I'll just go maybe 15 minutes after it starts, or half hour, I'll just slip in. But that's really not a good strategy. The better strategy, and, uh, and I actually saw two women at the, uh, the, the Ricky Harriman's table here. <laughs> I saw you guys do this. You got here early. Uh, when you get to a place early, you know, people haven't settled into groups yet. It's calmer, it's quieter, it's, it's easier to talk, it's easier to find conversation partners. So, so that's, a, that's my first tip, is to get there early, which again, is a little counter, counterintuitive. And uh, when you get there, don't wait around the edges. Simply walk up to a person or a group and say, may I join you, or what brings you to this event? Everybody is looking for people to talk to, so it's, it's easy. Uh, my second tip is to, to ditch the sales pitch. Uh, remember, networking is all about uh, relationship building. So keep your conversations fun, light, informal. You don't need to do a hard sell within minutes of meeting a person. The idea is just to get the conversation started. And you know, people are more apt to do business with, or they're more apt to partner with people that they enjoy being around. Um, and if someone does ask you about your product or service, be ready with an easy description of your company. And I'm always surprised that sometimes people don't have this. You know, be before the event, create a mental list of recent accomplishments maybe a new client you've landed or a new project you've just completed. That way you can easily pull that item off that mental list and bring it into the conversation. For instance, if somebody asks me what I do, I can say I work for the Story Exchange. We produce videos and articles about female business owners. And uh, if someone said, what are you doing lately? I could say, well, we're working on a two-part series for the New York Times about female chefs who don't often get as much media exposure as their male counterparts. Interesting, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, uh, by the way, when you do get involved in a conversation with someone, also don't forget to listen. And if you're not a natural extrovert, you're probably a very good listener. And listening can be an excellent way to get to know a person. And so my, my third tip is uh, just to don't forget to follow up. Networking is where the conversation begins, not ends. So if you've had a good exchange with someone, make sure you ask how, what the best way to stay in touch is, whether that's phone or email or LinkedIn or even Twitter or Facebook. Um, and get in touch within like 48 hours. Just, you know, we all have short memories these days and short attention spans. So get in touch within 48 hours and make sure to reference something you've discussed so that your contact easily remembers you. So those are all my tips and I've spoken long enough. It really has been an honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Congratulations to you all and please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Colleen. What inspiring words to encourage us. I personally am a big supporter of the Spanx industry, so thank God for Sarah Blakely. Um, okay, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors again, Business First Bank, the Junior League of Baton Rouge, Keen Miller Law Firm, and Ricky Herman's Florist and Gifts. A special, special thanks to each of you for being here. That concludes our program, so go out and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again. I'm excited, I'm honored and humbled both to have been recommended and selected, but 
more um, excited just the, the, the environment in the room and to see so many successful women doing great things. I'm incredibly humbled by this honor. Tell me a little bit about your company. How did it start? Where did you get the idea? Well, I was a marketing teacher at LSU for years, uh, but a competitive runner at the same time. So at some point in time, around 2000, I stopped competing. I didn't get my shoes for free anymore, and I felt like Baton Rouge really had a need for it. So I combined my business background with my love for, for running. What are some of the things that have helped you uh, become influential in business? I would say great mentors, um, both men and women who have been great role models and have basically given me the, the encouragement to say, go out and do it, you can do it. And then having great support systems, family, friends, and the great education from LSU to really open that door. Hey, what are some of the challenges that you have faced? Um, I would say just being, being young, starting, starting young and, and walking into positions of responsibility. And sometimes youth is viewed as, hmm, do you really know what you're doing? So that challenge, and then just, they've always presented opportunities for growth, though. So they've been great. Baton Rouge has been a very welcoming community, and it may sound trite, but I don't feel like being a woman was ever an obstacle for me in business here. Well, what would you say to young women that aspire to be future business women? You've got to find what you really like to do, and it makes going to work every day a joy. Uh, and be ready to work hard. I mean, you work harder for your own business than you'd ever work for anybody else. I would say young women should focus on developing themselves, developing their skills, uh, their integrity, and really doing a great job. When you give your word and say that you're doing something, people will depend on that. And so keep your word, do great work and your influence will grow. One of the tips is to be resilient and that that's something that can be hard for a lot of women. If you fall down it can be sometimes hard to get back up and women sometimes have a hard time with failure. They take it very personally. Whereas if you look at men in business, men have been in business a long time it's, I think, easier for them if they have setbacks, they just get back right on it. It's harder sometimes for, for women to be that resilient. So that would be my advice. You know, there's going to be setbacks. There are going to be times where you don't hit it out of the park. Just get back up again and keep on going. There's an, uh, uh, there's an expression in Silicon Valley about what do you call a failed entrepreneur? The answer is, that's an experienced entrepreneur. So think of it that way, that failures are things that we learn from.